Welcome back, everyone, to Zero... Uh, now is it done? Our main your host, Dominic, or Shadow Fury. And we have a match that has been highly requested between Kingstead and Steel Blue on Titan Duel. This is a... This is a Rover Duel. Rovers for Steel Blue, Rovers for Kingstead, and apparently this is really good, so I'm excited. Steel Blue going for a heavy dart start, while Kingstead going for more of an economic setup, getting the dart for scouting, and then going for the mason afterwards, just to build up faster. I generally would agree with Kingstead's approach, but... Steel Blue might be able to get enough harassment in there to make it not worthwhile. Really comes down to how quickly Kingstad's able to get the fences up. Scorcher should be built up by the time the darts are able to get in, so won't be a big deal. And Steel Blue able to win the dart fight, so at this point Steel Blue is perfectly safe in their own base. Scorcher will be coming in sooner rather than later, but the darts... Oh, are they going to be able to get through this? Steel Blue going around the side. Already should be able to avoid that first Scorcher. Already should be able to avoid that first Scorcher. But that's a question of what's going to happen afterwards, because now the fences as well. No knowledge from King's Dad of Steel Blue's positioning. And the Metal Extractor will eh, it's gonna take eight hits to go down. Ooh, but the Lotus! The Lotus! Oh, that Lotus! Saving the day for, for King's Dad. Steel Blue still has several darts that could come in there and deal some damage, but only one of the Metal Extractors is really vulnerable. Darts again, they deal about 50 damage per hit. So, Oh no, 35 now? Oh, I got nerfed. Never mind. Okay, they deal 35 damage per hit, they take at, they take about 11 hits to get rid of the metal extractor. So three of them together, that's four volleys. Yeah, okay. I didn't realize darts got nerfed. I guess it makes sense. With the slow beam, yeah, they used to be 50, if I recall correctly. They were basically half a dagger, but now they're a little less than that. On top of the fencer, King said should be able to hold them, hold everything off for the time being. That being said, Steel Blue should be able to expand quite quickly. They don't have the mason to do it yet, they just now got it. So that's the one thing. They've been relying a lot more on, on harassment and keeping Kingstead pressured than they have been on actually building an economy of their own. At this point, the opportunity is there, but the question becomes, how well is Steel Blue going to be able to do that? They're not going to have much to worry about for harassment. There's only a fence when it comes to some Scorchers. I mean, Steel Blue should be able to defend against that with few issues, I think. Yeah, Kingstead knows what's going on. Steel Blue kind of knows what's going on. They've got, they have darts in the field. They should be able to scout out the forces, the positioning from Kingstad's movement. So they know where Kingstad roughly is. They have their commander in place, which... Uh, yeah, they'll be fine. They'll live. Ah, there we go. Steel Blue, nicely done. Pulling your forces in to defend. That's what I want to see. So at this point, everything's fairly even. Kingstad has a slight economic advantage, which will be a potentially big deal, depending on how this fight goes. Looks like already the fencer being the main target. Good choice there, because that's going to be the highest point of damage. Unfortunately, that's still not that great. Steel Blue's still losing all their army. Forced to defend with a shoestring army here. Just only the dart and the scorcher against an army twice that size, with no defenses on their back. So Steel Blue, unless they're able to play this perfectly, they will lose this force. But it looks like Kingstead doesn't really want to potentially sacrifice their own army. So Steel Blue, getting lucky for the time being, able to actually expand a little bit faster than Kingstead as a result. Kingstead, on the other hand, is just making sure that their base is as well defended as possible. Getting the Stardust up. Haven't seen a lot of those used recently. I, they should have been, but they haven't been in several games I've seen. But they haven't been. Yeah, that's the thing. It is it is a bit of a problem for how to get... How to get Steel Blue into this match in a way that actually allows them to do any harassment. Because they've been playing a harassment style from the start of the game... They have a slight economic advantage now, but clearly they've been wanting to harass. And they haven't really been able to. At least, though, they are able to see that there is going to be a Stardust here. And maybe they can get rid of the Mason before that comes up. I doubt it. Although it does... Oh, actually, no, well done. Still slows down the Stardust enough that's not going to come up for a little while. And pulling King's Dead back. That's the biggest thing. Steel Blue able to defend by offense. Forcing their opponent to back off. Giving them a bit more room to breathe. Actually, also getting a couple Metal Extractors in the process. So Steel Blue doing a really good job here, just keeping Kingstad from being able to get away with basically anything. Stardust is up, mind you, so Steel Blue won't be able to pull that trick as easily again. But hey, Steel Blue's still ahead in metal. Both are accessing, mind you. Come on, guy. Come on, people! Get yourself caretakers! What were they just talking about in the last game? Okay, Kingstad spend the money on the on the commander. Not a bad choice. If you have money, you don't have any caretakers, you can't build them up in time. Upgrade your commander. It's a bit of a last-ditch effort, but. Just upgrade your commander. It will spend that money pretty efficiently. And especially getting that first level, the first upgrade for the commander, that's usually worth it. You can get a lot of defensive power off that and get radar or get armor or whatever else. Actually, what is Kingstad's plan? Armor and riot cannon. 
Okay, turning it into a nice chunky ripper. Steel Blow, on the other hand, again, they have a stronger economy right now. They are getting masons in their main base. It's not. It's it's basically the same thing. It's essentially a caretaker's worth of build power in their base. So that is good. That's what they want to do. Kingstead, on the other hand, they are going for the caretaker directly. So they're going to be a little bit harder pressed to build up an army quickly, but they will be able to get that without accessing too much. Steel Blue actually is a bit of a spread out territory right now. I mean, the Southwest is going to be hard to assault with the Stardust there, but not impossible. The Fencers outrange the Stardust, so no problems really getting in there. But at the same time, again, Steel Blue going for that defense by offense, trying to force Kingstead back. Kingstead not taking the bait this time, though. Steel Blue also not taking the bait as Kingstead counterattacks, but Steel Blue instead going to get rid of this Firebase over the... Well, not Firebase, the expansion over the western side of the map, which basically no resistance there. So at this point, it's just a matter of can they get rid of this leveler? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, the forces didn't all attack the level, or, sorry, the Ripper at once. Had they done so, they probably would have been able to beat it because Rippers don't do especially well on their own. Rippers do best when you have a bunch of them. If you have three or four Rippers, then you can take care of basically anything. If you have one Ripper, it can be easily overwhelmed by four or five Scorchers. So that is the thing to bear in mind. Of course, Spencers also deal with that, and... At this point, Steel Blue, again, providing the pressure. King's Dead losing a lot of metal extractors. They didn't fall back to defend, but they did lose a lot of economy because they didn't fall back to defend. Managing only to damage some of Steel Blue's infrastructure. Get rid of a couple power plants, some metal extractors. Steel Blue is still way ahead economically in the process, though. King's Dead, however, their commander in the center of the map. I find this curious. They're trying to set up some kind of defensive position right at the center of the map, which is basically in Steel Blue's territory at this point. If you look at where Steel Blue has already set up, this commander is very much at risk of dying. Like, now. Fence is already threatening it, pushing away the defensive position, and probably getting to the commander. If it weren't for the fact that there's a support force coming in the back and the Rippers are numerous enough to stop the Scorchers, I mean, the Fencer should be able to stop the Rippers. And then from there, it's just a matter of the Scorchers coming in and taking out the commander, because the commander, they have a riot cannon, but again, they're basically a Ripper. So the same weakness of Rippers applies, which is they get overwhelmed quickly. That's a low damage high alpha weapon, or low fire rate high alpha weapon. And as a result, King's Dead's commander forced to retreat. It won't die to the fencers. Should be able to retreat in time. Or, you know, retreat into the ground. That works too. Either fall back or fall down. Digs itself down to avoid being six feet under, and that keeps it alive for long enough to at least keep defending this position. And I'm guessing King's Dead's going to keep this here as essentially a buried caretaker. They just keep it in the ground, use it to build the defenses. It's still quite close to Steel Blue's base, so it could use that position as a jumping off point. Or it could just get out of its hole and start actually doing its job again. Eh, either way. Ooh, nice. Building a radar right next to Steel Blue's base. Actually, that had already been done. But rebuilding the radar is still good. At this point, Kingstad knows everything that's going on in Steel Blue's base. Apart from the exact, like, apart from their main base area, Kingstad's got everything known. Like, there's nothing that's surpri going to surprise them for movements from Steel Blue's forces. On top of that, Kingstead with a forward commander are able to reclaim quite effectively, so they have that going for them, and I don't really see a whole lot going for Steel Blue right now, other than a large enough army to to break through with casualties. Like, that's the problem. They could break through and actually could take out Kingstead's commander, but it'd be at the cost of their entire army and could lead them open to a counterattack. Probably would, actually. Honestly, right now, I'd like to see a few more Ravagers. I, if there's anything I'd like to see right now, it'd be about five or six Ravagers. Scorchers are good, good to have, but against the force that Steel Blue is... Sorry, against the force King's Dead's bringing to the table, Steel Blue going for Ravagers would allow them to basically punch through everything but the Scorchers. But yeah, Ravager Ripper would take out the Scorchers, take out the, the Rippers. Wouldn't take out the Fencers as quickly, but you can bring the Scorchers afterwards to follow up and take out the Rippers. But right now, the Scorchers can only really get rid of the Rippers and may... Sorry, the... The, re the fencers, and maybe with really good planning and really good timing, get rid of the rippers, but not easily. But at the same time, man, this counterattack from Kingstead making all of Steel Blue's early harassment look like absolutely nothing. That Scorch is able to come in here, rip apart all the caretakers, not quite get the factory, but able to at least push the Mason out. But at this point, Steel Blue basically, they're building at a third rate. While under fire. And losing most of their forces. And Kingstead is able to, well, okay, project force over to the center of the map. They haven't expanded much in the back line, so while Kingstead does have a reasonably strong economy, in large part due to the reclaim, they don't have as much territory to work with. Or, sorry, they aren't taking use of the territory they have. They have a lot of territory to work with, they just haven't exploited it yet. That's more what I mean. 
So with that, it looks like a counterattack from Steel Blue seems like the idea they have in mind. I don't know if I'd recommend it, especially the Scorchers have not managed to have a chance to heal up yet, but well, there they go. Guess they might as well go for it. I would actually almost recommend it getting a Mason up there to repair the Scorchers, but that's not the strategy being gone for. So right now, Kingstead, I... I mean, I see them having a fairly large advantage. Steel Blue does have a lot of reclaim to work with, though. They have a lot of metal extractors to build up. I get they're building the Caretakers first, and I totally agree. But they still have a lot of reclaim to work with. They can grab afterwards. 1,000 metal worth of reclaim. Another 6 metal per second worth of metal extractors they can grab. So it's not like Steel Blue's going to have a necessarily hard time rebuilding. And they were ahead for a while. But Kingstad was really efficient with that assault and really pushed Steel Blue back. Now Kingstad expanding in the meantime... Taking advantage of the fact that Steel Blue cannot really go in for an attack to just naked expand across the entire map. Take all the metal, throw in a few power plants here and there to keep their production going. That's all they really need. I mean, King's Dead is East only much, they do need those power plants. Like, now, if not sooner. But yeah, that's all they really need. Like, Steel Blue... They should be able to get themselves back on track fairly quickly. And actually do have... A, they have a nice economic setup to actually do that. I have the stored metal to be able to push 40 metal per second for a little while. They are 40 build power for a little while, so they should be able to at least keep pace with Kingstad's forces. But again, Kingstad's being a bit more efficient. Steel Blue, I mean, just how much they're fighting off the back foot here. I don't know what the plan is off this, though. The Impaler being built, good choice there. Should be able to help get rid of the Commander. The Dominatrix as well, great way of flipping your opponent's large army to your side. You can be careful with it, but the Dominatrix going forward is not what I'd call being careful. That will get a Scorcher killed in the middle. Actually, two Scorchers killed. Nice. Uh, not really intended, but hey, the Stinger taking out the Scorcher is still useful. Nothing else. Dominatrix does go down, but that was a great bait. Pulling in those Scorchers, getting them all killed for very little loss. I mean, losing only the Dominatrix in the process, but that is Kingstead's entire Scorcher force. So right now, it's just a matter of Steel Blue being able to hold off, ra or hold off Assault Forces, which is a lot easier than holding off Raiders. It's not like the Ravagers could come in just the sheer amount they can tank damage, but they're not going to be slipping by. Not easily. Same time, massive loss is only at the cost of a couple defensive structures. A follow-up attack could be a problem, but Kingstead does not have a follow-up army to attack with. Dominators have their own, sure, but the Ravagers are being forced to retreat, and there's not much left. There's only a couple Scorchers. I mean, okay, Scorchers are being regularly built, but Scorchers and Badgers and Dominators, but essentially, Kingstead's entire army was destroyed, and Steel Blue was able to defend while maintaining the Impaler Assault, and while maintaining their own economy. And building that up. And also while maintaining the Southwest force. And able to use that for reclaim. The one downside is the defenses have been gone have gone down. But the upside is that the defenses aren't necessarily going to last. Sorry. The defenses aren't going to be down forever. The point is there isn't a follow up force to take advantage of the Stardust having been destroyed. At the same time though. Kingstead does have the stronger economy. Steel Blue reclaiming their way into rough parity. But it's not quite enough. However, Steel Blue is still reclaiming effectively. They are taking advantage of the reclaim I was talking about earlier. It just, they had to rebuild their main base beforehand. So, that makes sense. And also getting their metal extractors back up as well. And actually, this isn't bad timing either. Because at this point, they have the forces to push back the, the setup that Kingstead had. Allowing this metal extractor up here to be much better defended by Steel Blue. Had they taken that earlier, it's more likely that Kingstead would have been able to attack it and destroy it. Causing that to be less cost effective. I mean, it still could have been rebuilt sooner for extra money, but yeah, it would have been a point where Kingside could have attacked and been useful attacking. That being said, though, okay, fine. I take back what's up about the Ravagers. They got surrounded. They, yeah, Scorchers got closed, got surrounded. Ravager Ripper is still a strong army, but the Rippers kind of need to be there to get rid of the Scorchers first, or the Ravagers will die to the Scorchers. There is a tactical element to it, which wasn't really used there. Kingstead, on the other hand, got the Caretaker for the Reclaim. The Buried Caretaker, that's that seems to be Kingstead's thing, I've noticed. Notice in the tournament, too, they're doing that a lot. And for good reason. When I mean, you bury the Caretakers, they're a lot harder to deal with. You can't easily deal with them from a distance. The Impaler is actually one of the better tools to deal with it at that point. But still, it's a lot harder. And I think at this angle, the Impaler can't even hit it from a distance. So no, the Caretaker is basically invulnerable. And that's all Reclaim. That's pretty much free money there. On top of the fact that, again, Scorch is getting in the back lines with nothing really stopping them. So maybe a couple Rippers. Okay, more than a couple Rippers. Forcing retreat, but whatever. Kingstead managed to get in and get, take those metal extractors, despite the fact that they seem so defensible. Kingstead got those follow-up, or got that, not follow-up, but rather the... It wasn't the follow-up, but it was just the attack force off the Scorchers. And 
did a number with that. Although I'm surprised Steel Blue, why are you not building another Stardust here? That would be a really good idea right now. This, yeah, okay, there you go. Because that the Scorchers, if they were to go over to the southwest side of the map, would be able to take out the south the southwest side of the map. It's just there. Yeah, that's all there is. Like you have this, you have this Stardust. Scorchers would come in, they would die. At any rate, that may not even matter. I mean, the Dominatrix coming in from Kingstead. Good idea. Good when Steel Blue did it. It's better when Kingstead happens to have three of them. Ah, oh, man. Steel Blue, what are you planning? Because at this point, it feels like running defense... Oh, okay. That's just not a bad plan. Go over to the north side. Start taking that out. Try to take some territory over along the eastern side of the map. But that doesn't seem likely to work in the long term. For the simple reason the Dominatrix is coming in here... Just ripping apart all of Steel Blue's army without really a fight. Like forcing Steel Blue to kill their own units. Okay, Dart's coming in here. I'm thinking going around the back trying to take out the Dominatrices from behind, but the Rippers will destroy them. Oh, no, I see. Distracting the Dominatrices enough off of cheap units that the Ravagers can actually get in and kill them. That's That makes more sense. What am I thinking? Of course you do that. That's always what you do. When you're dealing with something that deals a lot of damage and wipes out high... High value units, you throw in a bunch of low value units to distract them because they'll make them go on the reload time. Clever plan there. And of course, if that doesn't work, the darts can still just rapidly go behind, take out the dominatrix, and just be done with it. That works too. But hey, two dummies down out of three. Considering that Steel Blue has half the economy, that's not a bad setup, but at the same time, Dominatrix is still alive and not being taken out. Did actually manage to get a dart of its own too, so Steel Blue, valiant effort, but it's not unfortunately accomplishing much. Same time, the Impaler is finding some value? To some extent, getting rid of that Stardust, but I don't know. It's hard to really say. Even if that northeast side is destroyed, I don't know how much value that's going to give to Steel Blue when their main base is so heavily under fire. However, the Scorch is coming around the back, still managing to actually do a lot of damage. King's dead. Their commander could go... Their commander will go down here. The Dominatrix trying to put a stop to it, but no, it's not going to happen. King's dead. Losing their commander, losing their main frontline offense force here. Steel Blue, on the other hand, why are you just tanking damage, Steel Blue's commander? I might want to actually get away from the fencers. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Still, though, Kingston actually took a, took some of something of a blow. Not much. But the main problem here is now that Kingstead doesn't have a reclaim engine that can move around, that can also build up. This defensive line in the front line is essentially just being manned by units. It's not going to be actually static defense, unless this mason is able to survive. Which it probably won't, considering that it is now dead. That'd be a problem to long-term survival. At the same time, the Impaler is still able to do his job getting rid of the Stardust, or trying to, or the Stinger, either way. But yeah, getting rid of the defenses over to the north side of the map, allowing Steel Blue to start harassing that. So yeah, Kingstack got a little bit overconfident there, pushing their commander forward, and not managing to get a get around those Scorchers. I, I can't believe he didn't notice the Scorchers when they came around. But they did, and they did their damage. And now the revenge from King's Dad coming with their own Scorchers to take out the Masons and the Impaler. There's no Stardust here. This Impaler is dead. It didn't do a bad job. It got rid of the Stinger, so it was at least effective. But no, the, those Scorchers over from King's Dad should be able to leverage that into an attack on the main base. A couple of rippers, and ra rippers and Ravagers to defend from Steel Blue. At the same time, loads of Ravagers going over to the western side of the map. Steel Blue again trying their old tactic of... Attacking Kingstad to the point that Kingstad is forced to come back. But I don't know if Kingstad's going to care. This Thunderbird is likely to cause a massive amount of problems there. There is the Thunderbird attack, and there is the entire force disarmed. Thankfully for them, getting rid of the Stardust before they got disarmed. Stinger's still up, but it's nowhere near as much of a threat. I mean, they can, as you can just see with the Ravager, can dodge it and doesn't take as much damage. So at the very least, the Stardust was destroyed. Some Scorchers could actually come in here from Steel Blue and deal it quite a blow over to this western base. And again, because the, the commander's no longer here in the front lines, Kingstead can't really build a firebase right next to Steel Blue's base. Can't really contain them. That's what it comes down to. Steel Blue is no longer contained. Kingstead is no longer that far ahead in terms of economy as a result. And Steel Blue, they can actually get this reclaim and make it work for them. And they are, too. And rebuild the metal extractors. They can finally reclaim their base in every sense of the word reclaim. King Tad, however, does still have a bit of a larger army to work with here to stop that. Does still have the Thunderbird. Does have that hell of a force multiplier that is the Thunderbird. Scorcher follow-up coming in, which at least is getting distracted for the time being. How many seconds are there left? Ten seconds left on those Ravagers before they become useful again. 
and the Scourge is not going for the follow-up. Not going to risk it. So the Ravager is ultimately not being that inconvenienced by the Thunderbird. I mean, it was a pain, but it wasn't fatal. No, and by the way, that Flying Fin, that is still a scary Ravager Ball. The Thunderbird didn't really ultimately do that much. It was not followed up by the Scorchers. That being said, though, the Force over the side here is being followed up, but this is what I was talking about with multiple Rippers. You get three or four Rippers, and any size of army that clumps up is dead. One or two Rippers, no. Three or four Rippers, yes. It's just, it's this weird threshold with the way that the Ripper physics, like, the way that the, the attacks work by the fact that the attack is this low reload, high alpha attack. Like, high alpha attacks just like that, they've got this weird timing to them, and this weird way of having a threshold where you get over the threshold. For limp, for rippers, it's about three or four. I keep repeating that, I don't know why. Probably because it's very important to know. If you if you want to know how to play light vehicles, or rovers, and you want to play them effectively with the riot unit, get three or four rippers before you start going out with rippers. One is not enough, they are not reavers. That's why that's why I'm emphasizing it. The Clokybot Reaver, which is going to be a lot of people's first riot unit, that is able to deal with about five or six glaze before going down. And that is able to deal with a lot of stuff on its own. It's a light assault unit. It's got I mean, it's got a low alpha weapon, rapid fire, spread fire. It's got a lot of really nice properties that make it deceptive in how riots work. But no, rippers have none of those properties. Rippers have a high alpha attack that has moderate splash damage, decent amount of damage, but that's about it. So if you get enough of them, you're good. If you don't get, if you don't have the critical mass, then they don't actually do much for you. And to be fair, Kingside has more of the critical mass than Steel Blue does. Steel Blue losing a lot of those Ravagers to the earlier attack that ultimately will likely doom them. I don't see... I don't know. I do see a way out of this. They could go for the Thunderbird themselves. They have the forces to follow up with that. If they go for a Thunderbird themselves, they should be able to take out most of the forces here, especially the Dominatrices. Because that is the main, that is the biggest threat. Kingshead is just forcing Steel Blue to lose their own forces to themselves because of the Dominatrix. And I honestly don't know why Steel Blue has not built a Thunderbird. Other than maybe being worried about losing frontline forces. And I can understand that worry. That makes a lot of sense. The frontline forces for Steel Blue are under heavy fire. Their main... Everything is under heavy fire. Their, their commander's still alive, mind you. The commander's actually should be able to reclaim this. I don't know why it isn't, but... Would be able to reclaim this to get them a little bit more money. Actually, enough money to hold on. Right now, there's a 2 to 1 ratio, and that's not enough. Now, going for a Phoenix instead, though. You're going to try to burn out the Dominatrices instead of just lightning them and take out a ground force. That actually isn't a terrible idea. I still think a, I still think the Thunderbird is the better long-term solution. Especially given the Dominatrices don't go down to one Phoenix drop. So, you know, not a bad idea, just a little bit limited. Although, that being said, Dominatrix going down. Oh, of course, the Rippers can't target the Dominatrix, so they lose themselves. That's three Rippers to the price of just capturing one. Yeah, that's the Dominatrix for you. There are ways around it. I mean, we saw Steel Blue actually employ quite a few of them using the darts and even coming with the Rippers quite early to try to take them out in large force. And the Phoenix afterwards try to burn them out, but it's just kind of limited. The darts being easily the best option there. Or use artillery. Get Badgers. Set that up. That works too. Either way, though, you want to make sure that you're able to get rid of the Dominatrixes before they kill you. And that didn't happen. Not to mention, you also want to make sure you can just deal with your opponent's forces. Like, Kingstead, they had that forward base. They were able to do a lot with the forward base. And Steel Blue was holding their own quite effectively despite that. Even managing to exceed army value several times. And really, if it weren't for that one last push with the Ravagers, if that hadn't been destroyed, Steel Blue would have been able to take out Kingstead's entire force. It was just that one thing. Like, because the force, because Kingstead had that larger economy, Steel Blue... They were able to push in, but they, that wasn't the point to attack yet. And I realized that they were trying to do what they had done before, which was to attack in order to pull Kingstad back, in order to make Kingstad want to defend. It's just that Kingstad had the forces in the base to do that already, and it wiped out Steel Blue's entire army, and then that was that. Oh, I don't know. Okay, so, addressing chat a bit. Badgers, I don't know if they're still bugged about the, about the hits, because Badgers... There's a bit of a known thing where if the Badger hits with a projectile, it doesn't deal as much damage because the projectile itself, it has, like, basically it hits a mine and the mine explodes and it fires off a bunch of little projectiles that then hit. And I think they all deal 20 damage each and the projectile itself 
deals 20 damage. So I don't know if that's the case or not. Like, obviously the projectile should deal the whole damage if it hits directly, or at least that you'd think so. I mean, I guess there's an argument for counterplay if it doesn't, but if it, it sounds like a bug. Anyway. Yeah, also one thing people are pointing out in the chat about the physics. The one thing about the physics in Zero K, and I addressed this when I did the little Q&A thing, is that the physics in this game are really cool, and they offer some neat intricacies and interactions, and make it so it feels like there's always some new thing to learn about how to approach the game. It's just, they're also often hard to manage and control. It feels like it's kind of unpredictable layer on the game. It's it's not bad. Like, it's... There are games where it feels more like an unpredictable layer. It's one of the things I don't really like about Subcom, for instance, is that it doesn't feel like something you can control. Zero K, you can kind of control it. It's it's still something you got to manage, but it's also something that it's not unmanageably complex. However, I can understand why that might turn people off the game, especially from an esports context, because of just how much there's stuff going on that's a lot of hidden variables and if you look at games that tend to make it fairly big in an esports context they tend to be a lot more straightforward i mean you look at well okay i guess dota and league are examples where it's not really the case but there's not as many interactions there. there's a lot of breadth but any given character there's not as many interactions it's very straightforward starcraft every unit has a thing it does and rarely do you get weird knock-on effects of unit doing one thing then causes some other random thing to happen or not random thing to happen but some other thing to happen where it then causes large explosions. Whereas here, you can have situations where, like, we saw here a Scorcher got hit by a Dominatrix, and then the Stinger behind it hit it, hit the Scorcher that was taken over by the Dominatrix, while also hitting another Scorcher that was an, its own Scorcher. Or sorry, that wasn't Dominatrix Scorcher. That was, a Scorcher came in here, got killed by a Stinger, but then a Stinger next to it died as well. Sorry, a Scorcher next to it died as well. Damn, I can't keep it straight. The point is, the Stinger's friendly fire had a knock-on effect that was not expected we expect oh just kill your forces but it also kills or sorry kill your opponent's forces it just also kills your own forces and stuff like that it's neat and it's cool to have to think about but i can see where it might reduce the esports appeal of zero k as a game because it's not random but there are so many little things to think about that it feels like you're being screwed over by something that is not as deterministic even though it's fully deterministic it's just very complex I don't know. Okay, okay. I don't know if Zero K doesn't have the shock value of those games. It does. It kind of does, but it doesn't. Like it's. There are situations where you get a game where something happens that's really explosive. Sometimes, like you know, someone throws in a snitch. That's an obvious situation where things are reversed because of a snitch or or an imp. But you also have situations where it's something that. It's just this grind down 20 minute game of one player has a stronger economy and the other player can't really find anything to do about it. Which, granted, does happen in most RTS games, honestly. I mean, that's one of the things I don't like about Dota, honestly. Although, there are similar games that I do like, but they're shorter. Way shorter. Like 15 minutes per game. That's how long those sorts of games should take. So you can have long grinds and still fine, but I. Yeah, I guess I kind of see what you mean. There aren't as many really big explosive effects. Something I actually kind of like about this game because it doesn't get in the way. Like, can you imagine if this game had, like, Psystorm-style effects that lingered for a long period of time? Like, that would be difficult to parse visually. Granted, it's also because you have the zoom feature. Like, if you're zoomed in this close and you have some effect that comes in that takes up about, like, a tenth of the screen, like, takes up, like, this size of space on the screen, but you're zoomed in this close and you can see the units as well, then no, it's not as big of a deal. So I guess that is one thing to bear in mind. Because, like, this is, in terms of relative unit size on screen, I'd say this is about StarCraft II's zoom level. And at this level, yeah, you could very easily have a lot of effects like that and it'd be fine. But it's just, if you're playing 0K and you're out here, then it becomes a, I guess, a, okay, it's a smaller amount of screen. That's still a lot gets blocked off. And I don't know, I've played spring games that work like that. Like, Evolution RTS, great game. It does work like that. It's a little bit hard to parse after a while. Although I think that actually if any game would become like the esports champion, or the, the game to herald esports for spring, it probably would be Evolution RTS just for how much easier it is to get into and how much more straightforward it is. As much as I like 0K, I, it, that, is, that is a bit of a thing that makes it hard to 
hard to get into. Okay, and Sandon, that's an interesting point. Yeah, the pointing out that StarCraft, when someone something happens that's really cool and turns the game around, is because of amazing use of micromanagement. In Zero K, that can happen sometimes. But, yeah, unless you're playing with Glaives and using them brilliantly. Yeah, that doesn't really happen too often. It happens sometimes. But like I said, that's where the ticks and snitches come in. And that's not so much micromanagement as just executing a plan really well. That's not micro. That's a bit, a, a bit further back than micro. Not really macro, just, you know, pre-planned tactics, more than anything. But yeah, it's not clever mechanical use of the units, like you would have in StarCraft. Which is, yeah, that's fair. That is the thing 0k doesn't have as much of. It occasionally has it, but certainly not in a rover matchup. You're not going to have that in a rover matchup. Just the way the units move doesn't allow for as much clever movement. Yeah, usually when people win in 0k, it's because they took advantage... Of, like, if someone wins from behind, it's because they usually took advantage of information their opponents didn't realize they had and attacked an easily attackable position, like an area that wasn't well defended, and were able to do a ton of damage and just completely kneecap their opponent and then follow up with another attack. That's not so much good micro as it is good use of information. It wasn't a super clutch mechanical skill, it was just that they came in at the point where their opponents couldn't deal with it. Anyway... One last game, which could very well be a game that does involve this, is going to be Golda vs. Kingstead on Fairyland. So, stay tuned for that. Golda is one of those players that, if anyone's going to be able to take out people without doing much in the way of building up a massive army, it's going to be Golda. Because that's that's what Golda does, really. Anyway, stay tuned for that. It'll be up in a couple minutes. <laughs>